start again. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Still can't hear. No. Oh, well, let's try this. Is that better? You can rotate the base of that microphone. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, distracted skiers cause crashes. Defendant Gwyneth Paltrow knew that looking up the mountain and to the side while skiing down the mountain was dangerous. And she knew that skiing that way, looking somewhere else, blindly skiing down a mountain by looking up and to the side was reckless. And she knew if she continued to ski that way, that it was not a matter of if, but when, by looking up and to the side, um, it was not a matter of, uh, she would crash into somebody below her and someone would get seriously and permanently hurt. She knew what she was doing was dangerous. She knew it was reckless and somebody, well, and somebody would get hurt anyway. I think I just said that. But before we get into the details of this case, of how Gwyneth Paltrow's neglect, her choices, and her conscious disregard for other people on the mountain, all combined together to cause Terry Sanderson to suffer four broken ribs and permanent brain damage we first have to talk how skiers are supposed to ski down a mountain, what the rules of safety are, and the purpose for those rules, and what happens when skiers break those rules. That way we will all be on the same page, and we can get into the details of this case, okay? <coughs> all skiers know that when they are skiing down the mountain, it's their responsibility to pay attention, look downhill, and yield the right of way to the skiers below them. Because the skiers below them can't see behind them to control, um, as they turn left and right to control their speed, especially when there's multiple people on the mountain, it's the uphill skiers responsibility to yield the right of way to those below. And it's never enough to say, well, so what if I crashed into someone that was below me on the mountain? That doesn't mean it's all my fault. Because especially on a beginner run, they know that skiers may be less experienced and that skiers below them trust that the ones coming behind are paying attention. That's what skiers do. Before they start down a hill, they take account of how many skiers are below them, what those skiers are doing, and they keep their eyes forward down the hill so they can yield the right of way. And even though it can be challenging sometimes when skiers do these things, they get to enjoy skiing, they get to enjoy, practice their skiing, and most importantly, everyone gets to go home safe at the end of the day, and that's a good thing. But some skiers say, well, what's so wrong with looking up the mountain behind me and to the side while skiing down the hill? Just because a crash occurs on the mountain with somebody that was below me, that doesn't mean it's my fault. And some skiers say, well, what if the person below me on the mountain was changing directions quickly? Maybe it's their fault too. And finally they say, look, what's the big deal? You're not that hurt. And it's attitudes like this, behavior like this, and choices like these when crashes happen. And sometimes it's just a bump or a bruise. Sometimes it's a scare or a close call but sometimes it's worse. Sometimes it's broken bones, sometimes um, a concussion or permanent brain damage. And that's exactly what happened here. So let's get into the details of the case. 
Defendant Gwyneth Paltrow has skied since she was three years old and considers herself a, a, an intermediate skier. Miss Paltrow has skied about a half a dozen times at Deer Valley Ski Resort. She hires multiple ski instructors for her children, which allows them to skip the lines. The private instructors cost thousands of dollars per day. On the day of the collision, February 26, 2016, Miss Paltrow is skiing at Deer Valley with nine people, including her two children, her future husband, Brad Falchuk, his two children, and four Deer Valley private ski instructors. Eric Christensen is one of those private ski instructors. He has worked for Miss Paltrow's family for a handful of ski vacations in past seasons. Eric Christensen uh, knows the family well enough that one time he sent her son some pottery that he hand makes. A few minutes before noon, Miss Paltrow's group of 10 meet at the top of Bandana Ski Run to go to the bottom for lunch. Bandana is a green run about three quarters of a mile long. Deer Valley grooms Bandana every, day, every ski day. Skiers have skied on it for three hours. The snow is packed. Although a green run, Bandana is steep enough for skiers to pick up speed unless they make turns. Slow signs are always at the top. I'm just going to show you a picture of that real quick. This is not the actual ski day or the event. This is just a, an example of what Bandana looks like. So this is the top of Bandana Ski Run. Uh, these are, this is not the day of the crash, but it's near to the crash site. And as you can see, the top of the lift is where people get off and start to ski. And they come down, and uh, the rest of Bandana goes down about another half mile or so. just had one of Bob's uh, fisherman's friends cough drops and it's a little drier than I expected. Also at the top of Bandana is a meetup group of about six adults. A meetup group is a, a group that meets online to engage in activities like skiing, um, hiking, or bowling, or many other activities. Plaintiff Terry Sanderson is in this meetup group. Four in the meetup group um, ski down. Four of those in the meetup group ski down first. Then Sanderson skis down to the right. Craig Ramon is another person in the meetup group who skis about 35 feet behind Sanderson. Sanderson and Ramon know each other only through skiing in this meetup group. So they're not really close friends, but they know each other. And they've only done about a half a dozen of these meetup groups together. At the top of, uh, of Bandana, Ms. Paltrow, her two kids, and their two instructors are ready to go down to the bottom of Bandana for lunch. Before they ski, one of Miss Paltrow's children says, Mommy, Mommy, watch us ski. Okay. The children and their two instructors ski to the left. Um, and the, the, the two instructors are Eric Christensen and Carrie Oaks. Miss Paltrow skis down to the right. She turns her head up to look at her children as she turns her head back down, she screams. 
then skis back into the back of Terry Sanderson. She rides us back down. They hit the ground hard, and Miss Paltrow bounces off of Terry. The weight of both of them, their bodies, caused uh, Mr. Sanderson's rib cage and his arm to smash into the ground, breaking four of his ribs, two of them completely. Sanderson's helmeted head hits the ground, causing a concussion as his brain strikes the inside of his skull. Sanderson is face down in the snow, unconscious. Skiing 35 feet above them, Craig Ramon is the, is the only eyewitness to the, uh, of the crash. Ramon skis down and stops just next to them. He asks if they are okay. If they, are okay. they say nothing. Ramon, uh, again, is the only witness of this crash. Miss Paltrow is slow to get up. Her son's uh, instructor, Eric Christensen, skis over from the left and stops above Sanderson and screams at Sanderson, who is not moving. What did you do? What did you do? Surprised by the crash and Christensen yelling at Sanderson, Ramon thinks, why is this Deer Valley guy screaming at Sanderson? He didn't cause this collision. Christensen doesn't let up, so Ramon steps between them. Christensen stops yelling at Sanderson. Sanderson is still not moving. They ask Sanderson if he is okay, but Sanderson only groans. Craig Ramon turns to Paltrow. Are you okay? He asks several times. Are you okay? She doesn't say a word, and she slides a few feet down the hill. Terry moves a little and groans. My ribs. Paltrow turns away and bolts down the mountain to the bottom. Christensen turns to Ramon. Do you realize your buddy just took out Gwyneth Paltrow? Sanderson moves more, trying to get his skis around. Eric Christensen steps closer to Sanderson, picks him up by his hands, and stands him up. Snow is caked in Sanderson's goggles. Christensen turns his skis down the mountain, and he bolts, skiing straight to the bottom, following Paltrow's group leaving Sanderson and Ramon alone at the crash site. Sanderson is standing but hunched over, mumbling. Uh, and Ramon says, do you think you can ski? I think so. Sanderson tries but skis poorly. Ramon says, stop, stop, you forgot how to ski. Do you know your name? Harry, do you know where you are? I have no clue. Ramon says, let me get some help. And Ramon steps back and flags down a uh, Deer Valley employee and says, can you uh, get ski patrol here? This guy's been hit. He's hurt and he's uh, just out of it, disoriented. Smith, excuse me, within minutes, a Deer Valley ski patroller, Whitney Smith, arrives with a sled. Smith examines Sanderson, puts him in a sled, and takes him down to the first aid station at the bottom of Bandana. At the first aid station, Sanderson again is evaluated, and he still has some disorientation. His ribs hurt. Whitney Smith tells him, and his, uh, the group of people in the meetup group that are with him, he needs to go to an Instacare in Park City. Terry goes to the Instacare with someone who drives him. Uh, he's not sure who it was. And at the Instacare, he's evaluated. But the Instacare says, you need to go to an ER room. Uh, his uh, it looked, appeared that his pain in his ribs might be broken and he still had or he reported that he was unconscious. The next day uh, Terry goes into the VA emergency room. 
So what does the defense have to say about these things? First, they say, that's not the way this happened. He hit me from behind. I know the witness Ramon says he heard me scream and look up and saw the crash. I never saw Sanderson before he hit me. Sanderson was the one who hit me. This wasn't my fault. They also say, the defense, this is all Sanderson's fault. He's the one who can't remember the crash. My ski instructor, Eric Christensen, said he saw Sanderson above me making big turns and going really fast. This is Sanderson's fault. And they say, look, what's the big deal? He's 69 years old. Our doctors say he had some dementia and blindness in an eye and many other problems. Yeah, he broke some ribs, but those will heal. And 85% of people with brain injuries heal. What's the big deal? Oh, and, and look at his high test scores. He can't have, a brain can't have a brain injury. And finally they say, so what if he had a head injury and four broken ribs on the day of the crash? Eight hours later, he wrote to his daughter, I'm famous. That shows he can't be injured. And this is just about celebrity of Miss Paltrow. Because of the defense's claims that nothing Miss Paltrow did caused this crash and his injuries, uh, we, on behalf of Terry and his family, we contacted Dr. Richard Bain, a neurologist and biomedical engineer. He applies medicine and physics to understand traumatic brain injuries like this. Dr. Bain, the defense says nothing they did caused this crash and Terry Sanderson's injuries. Is that true? And Dr. Bain says, well, I don't know. Give me everything you've got, including medical records, scans, x-rays, reports, and so forth, and I want to examine him. Then I'll look at his case. But just so you know, you may not like what I say, but I'll tell you true. So we give Dr. Bain the x-rays, the tests, the reports, and Terry sees him for an exam. And after Dr. Bain has reviewed these things, we call him up. So Dr. Bain, what do you think? Bain says, no, actually, absolutely, she caused this crash. She hit him from behind, which means she was higher on the hill than him. Well, but how do you know? Well, he broke his four ribs when she hit his, uh, when she hit his back, knocking him down to the ground, and she landed on top of him, just like Ramon, the witness, said. The only way for his broken ribs on the right side could fracture like this is if she hit him from behind and landed on top of him, pressing his right arm into his chest. That's really the only way to have broken four ribs like this, too severely broken. Well, Dr. Bain, the defense says he should have recovered from the concussion. Well, that makes no sense because he still has symptoms more than 18 months after the crash. That means his brain injury is permanent. Well, Dr. Bain, will you be willing to come to court to testify to our jury so we can get this right because the defense says they are going to take this all the way to trial? I'd love to, but I'm busy that week but I can give you my deposition. So last week, the parties took Dr. Bain's deposition. You, the jury, will hear, uh, will see it this week. And just so you know, a deposition is an out-of-court sworn testimony where the lawyers on both sides testify or uh, ask questions to a witness. Um, and uh, in this case, it was recorded. So what happened to Terry? Well, the day after the crash, he goes to the VA hospital. At the VA, they x-ray his ribs and they say, yes, you've got four broken ribs, two of them broken completely. And then a few days later, they confirm Terry suffered a concussion in this ski crash. Over the next year, Terry is seen by 
various people at the VA, including uh, speech therapists and other doctors, a psychiatrist, and he's trying to get better. Terry doesn't want to have a brain injury. Terry was a uh, eye doctor in the Army for three years, a captain, and that's why he goes to the VA. But after a year, he's still got symptoms of a, of a persistent brain injury. So uh, I refer him to a Dr. Alina Fong. She's a neuropsychologist uh, neuro <laughs> in Utah County, and she treats thousands of uh, people who suffer brain injuries that are persistent. And Dr. Fong treated Terry uh, and, uh, from about a year and three months after the crash to about a year and six months after the crash. And Dr. Fong will testify in this case via video deposition because she had to, she couldn't be here for trial also. She has a conference in the Netherlands because she treats patients around the world and is a known uh, treater of people with persistent uh, post-concussive symptoms, which is basically a, a brain injury. So after this litigation began, uh, after 2019, Terry went to see a neuropsychologist, Dr. Wendell Gibby of Utah, who has examined and scanned thousands of patients with injured brains. Uh, a neuroradiologist is a medical doctor who specializes in uh, uh, radiology, everything from x-rays to MRIs to CT scans, and his specialty is also in neuroradiology, examining the brain. But he also examined the chest x-rays that were taken at the VA. And we ask Dr. Gibby, how bad is it? Dr. Gibby says, it's bad. His brain is permanently injured. He has persistent post-concussive symptoms. Although we can treat him, he will certainly have problems with his brain function the rest of his life. Well, Dr. Gibby, the defense says Terry's problems are pre-existing and his brain problems were there before the crash. Well, that's because that's what they always say about permanent brain injuries. Terry suffered a significant concussive brain injury in this ski crash. The injury is permanent. In other words, Terry will have problems with his brain the rest of his life. Well, uh, doctor, the defense says he has pre-existing brain issues such as NPH when he had the brain scan in 2009, seven years before the crash. NPH is normal pressure and uh, hydrocephalus. Basically, it's when your brain has too much fluid in the canals of the brain or the ventricles, and it builds up and it presses on your brain. It may actually make you more susceptible to problems from a concussion, but many people go their whole life without any symptoms, and they never know they have MPH unless they get a brain scan. Well, the, the evidence will show that Terry Sanderson had no symptoms of NPH prior to the ski crash. Dr. Gibby says because Terry was asymptomatic or had no symptoms before the crash, the brain injury he suffered in the ski crash is the cause of his current problems, not MPH. Well, the defense's three medical doctors the defense has hired three MDs and two PhD neuropsych neuropsychologists say, well, the MPH is causing his problems. And Dr. Gibby says, well, I'm not sure what they're thinking, but this ski, ski crash caused uh, Terry's current problems. Further, like Dr. Bain, Dr. Gibby thinks it's highly unlikely that Ms. Mr. Sanderson um, hit Miss Paltrow. The, the way he sustained the injuries to his ribs um, is more likely than not caused by Miss Paltrow landing on his back when he, Terry Sanderson hit the ground when, they, when she rode his back after the ski crash. Then we talked to uh, Dr. Sam Goldstein, a neuropsychologist who has a clinic in Salt Lake City. 
who treats patients with brain injuries. He's been treating people like this for decades. We asked Dr. Goldstein, what can you say about Terry's injuries? The defense says it's more likely dementia or um, NPH or other problems. Well, Dr. Goldstein says, well, it's, it's permanent and significant, this, this injury he had uh, when Ms. Paltrow hit him, because his family and friends and the people he knows before and after the crash report that he had very few problems before the crash, but after the crash, he has very significant problems. Because of that, we know, and because it's lasted for years, more than a year and a half, and now it's been lasted for seven years, we know he has persistent post-concussive symptoms. Goldstein says, yes, most people recover, but in a situation like this, where Ms. Paltrow denies she caused his injuries, it's like his frustration digs into his frontal lobes, so to speak, and his problems are permanent. Yes, he can alleviate them with treatment and medication, but he will have problems all his life. And these problems didn't exist to the, uh, before the crash. They came after the crash. And there is objective data that his ability to cope with life is diminished. Well, these doctors, Dr. Bain, Fong, Gibby, and Goldstein, you'll hear testimony from, two of them by videotape. Um, and most doctors like them say that the most important, some of the most important pieces of evidence for understanding brain injuries are these before and after witnesses. Again, these are people who knew t uh, Terry before and after the crash. You, the jury, will hear testimony from some of them like his two daughters, and uh, either today or tomorrow, you'll also hear from uh, Carlene Davidson, the girlfriend Terry had at the time of the crash. They'd been together about a year and a half, and uh, they spent a lot of time together. They, uh, Miss Davidson spent maybe three out of four weeks with Terry Sanderson in Salt Lake City. They traveled the world together. Carlene Davidson knew Terry really well and uh, she'll report on what happened after Terry or after the crash to Terry. A couple of things I'd like to discuss with you. The media has not been accurate. No Deer Valley ski employee saw the ski crash. Now some employees saw so, some people saw the crash. I'm going to object to referencing outside media. Yeah, sustain, that's not going to come into okay. the case. Some people, uh, the Deer Valley employees did not ski the, see the ski crash. The Deer Valley employees saw some things before the crash and some things after the crash. Uh, Craig Ramon is the only eyewitness who actually saw the crash. You're going to hear from him uh, later t today. He'll be the first witness. Now, after this crash, well, before this crash, Terry was a charming, outgoing, gregarious person. He volunteered for many things. He was a retired eye doctor. He had moved from southern Idaho to Salt Lake City about 10 years ago. He was living a full life, traveling the world, doing everything possible to enjoy his life and guard his health. He did not want a brain injury. He did everything possible he could to fix his brain injury. But after the crash, he's no longer charming. The before and after witnesses will show you this. We asked Ter Terry to step out during this part because I didn't want to rub his nose in his own problems. And during other parts of testimony from his daughters and some of the other before and after witnesses, Terry won't be in the courtroom. At the, at the end of this trial, the evidence will have 
clearly and convincingly established that the value, not the cost, but the value of the damages done to Terry Sanderson is $3,276,000. We look forward to showing you all of the evidence. Thank you, Mr. Bueller. Mr. Owens? Can we have a five-minute break? And I do want to address one thing with the court. Okay. Why don't we take a short recess between the lawyers' opening statements? So thank you. Renew the instruction number 45 for the defense. This court has found that there is insufficient evidence to assert a hit and run. They didn't use the words hit and run, but they said she bolted. And this jury is under the misimpression that that is an issue in this case. It's not an issue. That was ruled on summary judgment. All that remains is a negligence claim. One can't be negligent for bolting from the scene of an accident. That's an intentional conduct. So I ask for that instruction right now. Your Honor, the first witness, those are his exact words. And he's testified that in front of and it's been provided to defense counsel before the litigation, during the litigation, in a deposition. His deposition lasted six hours, and the defense interrogated him on this, and he never changed his testimony, and that's his testimony. Now, they can quibble with the testimony and dispute the testimony, but I did not use the word hit and run. Eric Christensen came up. People asked, are you okay? The evidence will show that what I said in the opening is accurate per the only eyewitness, Craig Ramone. And obviously the concern is that there may be an implication that it goes to duty. And as long as you're not making an implication that she had a duty to do something different, the testimony of the witnesses is what the testimony of the witnesses is. You can ask your questions. You can point things out. You can make your arguments. But my ruling on the Instruction 45 will stand. Thank you. Short five-minute break. Thank you.